Hi, and welcome to the KVM Forum 2020 panel discussion. My name is Stefan Heunitzi, and I'm going to be the moderator for this discussion today. We have with us panelists who um, are from organizations that contribute to QMU and KVM. And we have a list of questions from uh, the community that have been suggested as topics for today's discussion. Before we dive into the questions, we're gonna go around and let the panelists introduce themselves. Um, so let's begin. Um, would you like to introduce you to, uh, yourself, Susie? Uh, hey everyone, uh, this is Susie Lee from Intel. Uh, I'm managing the Intel open source virtualization team. Thank you. Um, Richard, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Richard Jones from Red Hat. Um, and I work on uh, V2V, some virtualization things, some MVD things, um, and other topics in the vert space. Thank you. David Kaplan. Hi, uh, David Kaplan from AMD. I'm a security architect. I focus mostly on confidential computing technologies like encrypted virtualization. Thank you. Um, Peter Maida. Hi, I'm Peter. I work for ARM. I've been seconded into Linaro for about 10 years now, working on QEMU, mostly dealing with ARM-related emulation work. Thank and you. I also do a bunch of the admin and build type stuff as well. Didn't duck fast enough to avoid that. Thank you. And Hubertus Franke. Yeah, I'm Hubertus Franke from IBM Research. I mostly work in architecture and uh, operating systems and the interfaces and now how they basically surface up in uh, cloud environments. Thank you. Okay, well, let's begin. We have an Etherpad that was submitted by the, the, the community with uh, questions in a, a bunch of different areas, and we can just keep going until we run out of time. This year, one of the trends seems to be encrypted VMs, confidential cloud, and so on. Uh, so we, let's start with a question from there, because I know that several of you have been looking at this area and uh, are involved in that. Um, so, so for the, the first question, let's, let's start discussing um, what other use cases for encrypted VMs have you looked at besides improving privacy in the cloud? So feel free to just jump in. Yeah, so I, I can... Go ahead. I, I can start on this one. So, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting question. Certainly, there are a lot of use cases in the cloud. And I know at AMD, that is probably the primary place that we focus on when we talk about confidential computing, uh, whether it's traditional virtualization, container, lightweight virtualization, things like that. Um, but the question was about scenarios beyond the cloud. And, you know, maybe there's one that I'll offer that I think could be interesting in the future. And that would be sort of a bring your own device type scenario. You could imagine a corporation that uses employee devices, but they have sensitive data. They have special programs that they want to use and they don't know what malware or other programs might be installed on the employee device. And so in that sense, you have a similar trust model to what you might find in the cloud in that you have a employer that wants to run a secure workload in an otherwise untrusted system. Uh, so I think that could be an interesting scenario, um, maybe in the future. Although, as I say right now, we're, at least at AMD, we're primarily focused on cloud. So I, I would say that uh, anytime you basically have some form of service provider, right, uh, whether it's in the cloud or not, uh, uh, such as edge computing, these are interesting use cases, right? It's not clear to me yet at this point uh, when applications basically driving towards the edge, whether we still going to include this into the cloud computing uh, scenario or not, but certainly similar to what David just said, you know, the moment you're running in an effectively untrusted environment uh, and application, they are certainly going to have to look at uh, encrypted VMs. Yeah, one thing I want to add is, uh, you know, certainly a lot of the usage is uh, for the encrypted VM is in the cloud space, but also we are now uh, seeing a lot of the development uh, of virtualization use cases in the client space and also in the, you know, IoT edge space. 
So for example, there are more and more uh, workload consolidation happening there. And also, you know, the virtualization based security, right? For example, you want to run, uh, you know, virtualization based um, uh, TE environment. So, and all these are, you know, based on VT. So this could be a lot of uh, architectural um, options on how to do this. So I think that's uh, having encrypted VM there, you know, will definitely, I think that's, uh, will bring a very interesting architecture option into that and has a profound architecture impacts. Okay, thank you. So we have a follow-up question that was posted about memory isolation. Uh, isolation. So I, I guess this is a, a more technical one. It's a question of how is memory isolation being done? And, and you can interpret that how you want. I'm not sure whether they're thinking about caches and avoiding side channel attacks and so on. Um, so please go ahead. So in general, this is done through the uh, uh, memory controller, right? So when essentially an encrypted VM posts a load store operation. It's effectively going through your caches and at, at the end, it's basically tagged with the uh, address space ID. Uh, and uh, at the mem memory controller level, uh, it's going to go through the various encryption mechanisms that are being provided. So data is then encrypted writing out and on the way in, it's being decrypted. From a caching, uh, I guess Susie and David can speak more to it, uh, but you will effectively have to tag the caches, right? So to make sure that uh, nobody can snoop on your cache outside your address space. Yeah, I mean, I would just add to say that that kind of gets into the implementation details. And, you know, I think different vendors have chosen to implement this in different ways. Uh, but I think that, you know, everyone has some sort of a solution for it. You know, there are a few different general techniques for isolation. There's uh, cryptographic isolation, as uh, Ubertus kind of talked about, where if you don't have the correct encryption key, then you're not able to access the data. Uh, there's also so-called logical isolation, which would be where you use a mechanism, whether it's uh, page tables or something of that sort, to actually block access to data that you're not supposed to have. And um, I, I know at AMD, we use both. Uh, in different cases, and I, I'm sure that other vendors uh, are similar. It's actually a good point, David. I mean, you do either in-space isolation, right? You guarantee that uh, you cannot access, or you basically, if you allow access, then it doesn't have to make sense, right? So that's basically the content isolation, right, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, to, to take it a step a step higher, right? There's kind of four general types of isolation. You could have physical isolation, which would be running on two different machines. Obviously, you know, that's not what we're doing. Otherwise, we wouldn't have virtualization. Uh, there's temporal isolation of running one workload and then sort of getting rid of all the traces of it and then running a second workload. And then you have the logical isolation and the cryptographic. And I, I think that for confidential computing, the logical isolation and the cryptographic make the most sense. Uh, but all of them, you know, have trade-offs. Okay, thank you. And this leads us on to kind of the, the final encrypted VMs question, and that is about this mechanism is designed to provide confidentiality, but what do we do or, or what, what does the software and the hardware do in order to mitigate issues that might be discovered later on in these designs. How do you, what should users do in order to protect themselves and not put all their eggs in one basket relying on this mechanism? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I can take a stab at it, but I don't wanna dominate the conversation on this. Uh, certainly, you know, it, it is prudent to think about that scenario. And uh, I know at AMD, we've, uh, done some work, especially with our newer technologies, to try to provide stronger guarantees around mutable components in the architecture. You know, it's very common in these kind of setups to have some firmware or, or you know, trusted components that can be upgraded in the field, which is great for fixing bugs. But then you do have to deal with the issue of how do you prove that you're actually running the version that you need to be running. Uh, and so we've taken some steps recently to create more of an architecture around that where there's actually a cryptographic proof of what version you're running and that can help ensure that we are able to deploy patches when needed and you can be assured that you're running with them. 
Um, the other thing, which I'll just, you know, kind of give a call out to the, the Red Hat folks here is uh, Red Hat has a very interesting project uh, called Enarchs. And uh, as I understand their, their vision, one of the goals is that sort of you write your application and then it can run on multiple different backends, whether it's AMD, SCV or Intel SGX or, or even ARM. And so, you know, sort of the question of how do you avoid putting all your eggs in one basket? Well, if you do have a uh, infrastructure like that and you wake up one day and you discover there's a zero day in one vendor's technology, then it becomes very easy to just switch your target to a different one. And so I think that's a very, uh, very interesting approach. Yeah, and I was going to mention Enox as well. Of course, Enox is based on WebAssembly, which is, as I understand it, how they're going to do this portability between completely different platforms. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a slightly related topic uh, about cloud and about hardware, about new hardware innovations. Uh, and the question is about with hyperscale clouds building their own silicon hardware, and I guess it's talking about tier one cloud providers who are able to optimize everything to the, to the last few percent um, and are able to deploy custom hardware for their cloud. How do we keep users of commodity hardware happy? Um, what, what, this is an open-ended question, so I don't know if you have any thoughts in this area. Yeah, I can I can take a you know, first step on this one. So I think that's uh, it's really the um, you know the level and the pace of the innovation you can drive, right? To make sure your customer workload can run uh, well on your platform. So I think that uh, involves a lot of uh, you know deep engagement uh, with, with your customers to really understand um, you know what their workload, the characteristics, and how the you know we can design in the hardware in a way that is uh, able to support all this uh, software workload. And also I think another thing is um, you know for this um, you know this. Uh, commodity hardware, uh, the terminology here, I think we actually are targeting, um, you know, we're having a large deployment, uh, you know, that's the base, and then we're targeting a wide range of, uh, you know, the uh, segments, right? For example, the, um, you know, the client devices, the IoT edge, and also, um, you know, the all the way to the data center. So I think this, um, brings us a very unique, um, you know, end-to-end -end advantage uh, to allow us to, you know, have a better, um, you know, workload, uh, workload compatibility across, uh, you know, the full stack. And, uh, um, you know, the, uh, we can optimize for the end-to-end -end use. It brings us more opportunity to optimize for the end-to-end -end stack as well. And another thing is, I think uh, beyond, the, um, you know, in this uh, uh, commodity hardware space, we're also offering accelerators, various accelerators for, uh, your, um, you know, the customer specific uh, usage, the segment specific usage. So you can kind of tune the hardware and uh, uh, using acceleration to optimize your you know, software. Thank you. So uh, Stefan, this actually also goes back to the previous question. How do you basically not put all your eggs in one basket, right? It basically means you have to move up the chain. You have to use portable libraries, right? And for instance, when you take uh, machine learning as an example, right? Uh, people have basically uh, uh, joined effectively the TensorFlow community, right? That becomes ultimately my, my portability platform, so to speak, right? And underneath you essentially build now devices that uh, effectively uh, cater to exactly that interface, right? So if you step away from specific hardware where you can, number one, right? Uh, that kind of at least the end user is somewhat isolated from, from hardware changes then, right? But we also see that uh, particularly with hardware, these uh, uh, in the cloud space, more and more things are basically driven down out of the uh, OS space per se and being driven down into the hardware devices themselves, right? Uh, network cards becoming significantly more capable with the virtualization capabilities, right? And ultimately they don't even shine through to the, uh, to the uh, end user, let's, let's say it's a VM. It's only the very high-end uh, VMs, such as for utilized for HPC and so on, that are effectively interested in getting access to a much lower interface, for instance, to run DPDK or something of that nature. Thank you. I, I think that maybe maybe Peter has uh, an interesting perspective to share here, because with from the ARM uh, architecture, what an area where ARM was extremely um, successful 
is in allowing um, the integration of, of, of custom systems on chips and, and custom boards. Um, and yet they ended up also providing a standard server platform. Um, so I don't know, Peter, if, if you want to kind of, if you have any thoughts on this, because it's kind of interesting that ARM has evolved into the uh, offering a standard server platform for, for, for maybe having a more commodity, you could say, um, hardware environment versus the versus the custom designs that uh, ARM is also extremely popular in. Well, uh, so I'll start this off with the disclaimer that I'm not an expert in this area of how ARM does stuff. But I think my, my view of what has gone on with ARM has basically been, there's a balancing act here. So different companies that want to use bits of ARM hardware and build their systems around it. They want to have things that they want to do that is like that's the difference that they bring to it. But you also want to have a common ground, which is what ARM provides in the architecture itself. So that it, the idea is that it's different where the difference really is significant and useful and where it isn't so, where it doesn't matter so much, you try and avoid those differences and, and you can gradually standardize things. And I think that's definitely, you can see that in the server space where the server space is much less tolerant of random weird stuff. And so there are a bunch of things like the server-based system architecture spe specs that standardize that so that if you've got a distro, you can run that distro on whatever server hardware you like. But there are also people in the server space who, while yes, they're do doing standard systems, are still putting some of their own magic source in there to because that, that's that's the point. That, that's why they're not. They don't want to just build something completely off the shelf. So you've got to make a, maintain a balance there. I think. Thank you. Okay, so one of the topics we have is CPU architectures, and um, that's always an interesting one for KVM because KVM supports multiple architectures that implement virtualization in different ways. They have different instruction set extensions and approaches to the virtualization hardware features. So where do you see potential cross-architectural collaboration? Uh, for example, with encrypted and isolated guests all doing their own things, are things gonna converge? Or what areas do you see where maybe in KVM we can um, have common infrastructure? So um, in terms of KVM, and one of the, when we look, for instance, at the encrypted VMs, right? I mean, there's AMD, SAV, uh, uh, Intel TDX, for instance, is going to be uh, coming out, was announced last month as a, as a result, as an example. The whole level of key management, right? I mean, in confidential computing, you cannot have any of your data or any of your keys in, 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 the, in the open. That means uh, from a service provider as well as from an end customer, I need to have an infrastructure in place that allows me to uh, shovel keys around in a secure fashion that is not being exposed to the service provider, okay? There, I believe, is uh, an ability to, uh, to uh, have a common ground. Uh, as David knows, uh, features like, for instance, VM migration, right, which uh, essentially has to go at a lower level uh, and, again, uh, encrypt or shovel encrypted data around, uh, seems to be there is a commonality among architectures, right, for instance, when they're using an encryption key, as, uh, as discussed earlier on, right. Again, that could be uh, provided in a more generic feature. Uh, I think going further into architectures, the whole area of encrypted I.O., right? I strongly believe that, particularly in the cloud, that uh, I.O. devices will largely be, become uh, completely SIV enabled with offload functions and that these uh, uh, virtual functions, so to speak, can be reached through to the uh, virtual uh, interfaces or the virtual agents running uh, or virtual clients, VMs, containers with uh, will directly access the IO devices to bypass the operating system, right? So again, along that path, the whole setup of having an, uh, a clearly secure encrypted channel uh, will be important, right? Again, many of these things have to be set up by QMU at the end of the day, right? And uh, there seems to be commonality across different architectures. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a good point. You know, I think that it's unlikely that we'll see much commonality when it comes to the hardware implementation, just sort of because of the business reality of that. Um, but providing a uniform software interface, kind of like what KVM already does for virtualization, I, I think is very reasonable. Uh, I think that, you know, the IBM Power also has uh, some 
you know, confidential computing technologies in it. And I believe that there's already been some effort to, to merge some of that with the work that AMD has done just to share some of the code there. Uh, so I, I think that, yeah, that's a, that's going to be a good area, uh, especially as now more vendors have announced technologies and from an end user standpoint, I think they would really appreciate a common interface. Yeah, I very much agree on that. I think a common interface is uh, definitely the, um, place we can have a lot of uh, collaboration. Uh, for example, I think in the, um, you know, the encrypted VM space, we're already seeing some uh, good collaboration on, you know, for example, how to define the exposed uh, key um, management, uh, you know, the key ID to the C group, right? How to abstract in a way that can support both, uh, you know, the Intel TDX and the AMD CV. And I'm sure there's uh, uh, many other sp spaces as well. For example, hey, for example, on the you know, for the encrypted VM technology today, we require to, um, you know, modify the uh, guest OS to collaborate with the hypervisor. And currently the interfaces are different across vendors, right? So, um, you know, are we able to kind of have a unified interface that can, you know, certainly uh, help our customers to uh, deploy much easier? I think that's definitely so maybe one area we can look into. Thank you. So on this theme of software, um, um, you know, so common software interfaces and so on, we have a question about management stacks. And the question is, what management stack do you have in place today? Is it libvirt based? Is it a custom QMU management tool? And maybe even a, a custom uh, virtual machine monitor that you're using instead of QMU? And how has this changed over the past few years? This is an easy one for, for Richard Jones from Red Hat, right? <laughs> I, mean, I, I would turn this question around and say, um, how has Libvirt itself changed and how is Libvirt changing? Um, I mean, Libvirt was this mon monolithic single node management demon. Um, and then we tried to you know, fit that into the, um, to the Kubernetes model where you're running everything in a pod. Um, and then we came across this problem, should, you know, should each pod run its own copy of Libvirt and so on. And, and from that, we started to basically um, look at how we can make Libvirt more, you know, not, not so monolithic, more separable, um, move things like the, the, the creation of the QEMU command line out into separate libraries. Um, I mean, it's not something that I'm a huge expert on this because I'm, I'm not really directly involved in this, although I am sort of using some of the fruits of this, but there's certainly this question is in, in a sense um, backwards, I guess, because maybe if you if you thought that Libbert worked in a particular way, it's like this huge monolithic demon, well, you know, take another look at it now. Um, it may be different from how you expect it works in like, yeah. Um, and, and I think the Libra team is extremely aware of the sort of traditional model and the problems with that. And, and there's a huge push within Red Hat. There's certainly no secret to, to, you know, move everything towards Kubernetes and OpenShift. Um, and so, you know, the making Libra run on OpenShift is like number one priority at the moment. I hope that, I hope that's a sufficient answer, Stefan, but, um, Thank you. So, I mean, since I'm, I'm with, with IBM Cloud in a, in a way, right, in, in a research organization, right, I, I do think uh, we use Libvirt basically as a conduit, right? It does give you additional lifecycle management not to have to do with the insane QMU uh, command line interfaces, right, <laughs> that everybody knows about. Um, but uh, let me t uh, turn the question a little bit around, right, uh, which is essentially is a, a when you ask about VMMs, right? We actually see that there's uh, quite a bunch of activities uh, like firecrackers, Intel uh, cloud hypervisor uh, VMMs that are basically spawning up that are trying to move different technologies uh, in. So for instance, uh, many of them are Rust-based under the premise that Rust is a better and more secure programming language, right? We're not gonna go into detail here about that, but uh, it is out there, this question, right? And so uh, our focus has been more on the QMU side, right? Uh, you know, it, it's a huge investment that has been made uh, in, in QMU, right, over the many, many years. And we're trying to leverage that and basically addressing some of the concerns that people have raised with QMU, which basically uh, similar to Libvirt has been 
it's a pretty large entity uh, of, of code, right? And uh, it also has gone through quite some life cycle. It's much more configurable these days, right? And uh, new techniques can be, for instance, be integrated into that particular uh, uh, code base. So for instance, uh, in our end, we're looking at control flu, flu integrity. You know, we're having now hardware features coming with various uh, architectures that allow us to do control flow integrity in hardware, right? Uh, need support for that in the compiling uh, uh, tool chains, right, number one. Number two, as you know, Stefan, there's also the, the uh, proposals, uh, I think largely driven by you effectively, right, that uh, essentially says, okay, can I take the somewhat configurable architecture that exists today in QMU and do a piecewise migration to uh, new technologies, like for instance, introducing Rust as an IO sub, uh, for IO emulation. Right? You don't want to have this monolithic code that once you have been broken in because maybe of a device driver bug or something of that nature, right? And to basically put your VM at, at risk, right? So essentially compartmentalizing it is actually a very good idea. And the IO submodel exactly gives you that ability. That's number one. On the topic of uh, next generations, where I think we have seen that what used to be the more legacy VM technologies, like, okay, here's your machine model emulated, right? We have now basically realized that the uh, interactions between the VMM uh, and the uh, VM itself is very chatty, right? That's basically where uh, devices like Word.io and then sprung out, right? So you can maybe uh, provide basically a more streamlined implementation. And I believe more work can be done in that case. At the end of the day, and I think that's where some lessons can be learned from Firecracker and uh, Intel, cloud hypervisor is to really in a cloud environment think about it what is my machine model that i really need do i actually need a uh, do i really need a pci bus emulation right it's not clear to me if we actually need that right if your machine model truly is just here is a bunch of word io devices do i need this to be through a pci bus that is an architectural feature that's already being emulated yeah. so i think there's quite some uh, research that can be done in that area Thank you. Okay, so we have a big, bigger uh, list of questions around the developer community. And these are things from how do I get started to um, about the QME project itself to the process and how organizations are able to get features upstream and collaborate. So we can um, take a look at some of them. So um, the first one, it's about specialization versus generalization. It's should developers work across the full virtualization stack or should they specialize on a particular component like KVM kernel module or QEMU? And how does this work today in your organization? Well, I can take I a crack think... at that if you like. Oh, oh sorry, uh, no, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I think that some of that depends in terms of what do you want to do. It depends on your own preferences. Some some people really like being able to put together a complete feature by doing a little bit of work at every layer in the stack. Some I, I tend towards the other end of the thing. I tend to like to look at one component and get quite deeply involved and knowledgeable about it and then just work on that one component. So some of that is just personal preference. Um, in terms of how does ARM work with this, we tend more to be a bit more split up in terms of, well, I'm mostly doing Chromium stuff and there are some people, other people who work for ARM who are doing only the kernel stuff, but that's kind of organizational reasons rather than because it's necessarily the most efficient way of doing it. I, I mean, I think at Red Hat, we have people who work, you know, in both that way and that way. So they work, some people work uh, across all the layers of the stack and some concentrate on a single layer. So it's so much down to the programmers. And I think if you're talking, if, if this question is really about how do we get new developers on board and should those developers go that way or that way, I think it probably doesn't matter. I mean, getting new developers is the thing rather than um, which particular way they work. Um, there certainly are features which we develop. I mean, almost all of the features, I should think, that go into QMU sort of end up having a, a libvirt um, component and then even perhaps a you know a vert manager or a kubevert component on top of that so there may be sort of two or three um, different places languages um, styles communities that 
that you have to interact with in order to get a single feature added. Um, whether or not this is a good thing, um, it, it has its it has its ups and downs. Speaking diplomatically. Um, what about at Intel? How how does that work? The contributing to say the Linux kernel and the KVM kernel module versus QMU versus higher level projects. Yeah, I agree with uh, what uh, Richard and Peter say, right? I think it's just, uh, we need expertise, um, um, you know, in both areas, people who are concentrating on one component and the people who are, you know, able to look at the whole stack and drive the, you know, the system optimization system triage. So I think both are very, very important. Uh, it really depends on, you know, the engineers, what's the engineer's passion, you know, which way he likes better, right? And also uh, where his talent is. Thank you. Um, uh, David, did you want to add something, um, or, sh or should we move to the next question? Uh, I, I I don't know much to add. I think what other folks said is is true. Uh, you know, I, I will just point out that at least when it comes to uh, implementing new hardware features, especially things like all this confidential computing stuff, that really requires a full stack approach. And so it does require that expertise of, you know, being able to know enough about all the components to actually fit things together. So um, I certainly think that's a valuable skill. Excellent. So the next question we have is, how would you describe your process for developing new hardware features and enabling them in the Linux and KVM software stack? And how can it be improved? I mean, maybe there are some frustrations there. Uh, may, maybe I can, I can take a first step at this one, right? I think that's uh, uh, for designing our hardware features, it start with uh, uh, defining the, the problem, right? So what problem are you trying to solve? Is this, uh, um, you know, supporting a new emerging use case or you want to make the existing use case more, for example, more efficient uh, and more, you know, secure, right? So. Um, and during this uh, uh, problem definition phase, our software team actually works very closely to uh, our hardware design team uh, to give them input on, you know, hey, what are the, you know, pain points we see on the software side, right? And I, I'm sure, you know, that uh, other vendors do the same thing, you know, the software team, and also we get the input from our ecosystem partners on what are the pain points they are observing, right? So this is a define the problem phase. And then we were starting on the you know um, technology readiness kind of pace, right? So doing the past finding, doing the POCs to really make sure you know the um, we have a how you know sound uh, you know hardware design and uh, the hardware implementation is software friendly, right? So. Um, and then that's uh, when going to the, um, you know, the um, after the technical ready phase, we move on the, assume this is approved, then we go to the uh, uh, POR phase, the plan of a record phase, right? We will, you know, that's uh, um, start the execution, right? That's uh, uh, have our engineering team will do the, you know, the pre silicon enabling, right? Before hardware is available, we will implement the, this in the, for example, in the software simulation environment. So to make sure we have, uh, you know, code uh, as early as possible. And then we will uh, submit this to the, you know, the open source community. Uh, to get the community feedback on the architecture, on the implementation. And after, you know, that's uh, uh, many, many rounds of discussion, you know, we just we got merged into the open source uh, community. Right. So this is the upstream part. And then we were on the downstream part, we will work uh, a lot with our, um, you know, downstream partners like the Red High, you know, Asuse and other and our CSP partners to make sure all these technologies can productize in your distro in their uh, deployment. So I think that's kind of the, the high level flow of how we do, uh, you know, how our feature uh, enabling. Um, in terms of um, improvement, I think that's, um, um, as I say, I think currently um, I see, you know, we, our software team is already involved a lot in the hardware feature definition. We'll do many kind of hardware software co-design together. 
um, you know, but I think that's uh, given the more and more importance of the software, you know, uh, so I think I'm looking for, you know, we can do uh, more on the, you know, the software hardware co-design side. So to really, uh, I think that's a, a lot of opportunity we, uh, we can kind of uh, uh, dig into in that space. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just add to say, you know, it's a challenge definitely, especially because the hardware design cycles can be so long that by the time that feedback, especially from the open source community uh, is present, then it's sort of too late to, to change things. Uh, and, you know, that's, that is a challenge that I, I'm not quite sure what the solution is. You know, certainly when you know, a company like AMD de is developing new hardware features, we will have conversations with our software partners about those and get feedback. Um, but, you know, we don't typically have those conversations with the public mailing list for kind of obvious reasons. And I'm assuming that, you know, Intel works similarly. Uh, and so, you know, the, the downside of that is that by the time that there is a discussion on the public mailing list, probably things are pretty well baked and there's, there's less opportunities to incorporate feedback. So, you know, I think that's something that it would be interesting to improve. I'm not quite sure what that solution would look like, but that is um, sort of a gap, I think, in our design process. I think it will be interesting to see what the Risk Five folks do with this and whether they manage to make a better job of the whole interaction given they, they don't they're not unlike the rest of us they're not working under that same set of restrictions so are they going to be able to make a better designs as a result that will be interesting to watch yeah so this whole thing seems like an area where amd or intel uh, and ibm an arm need to come together and invent a time machine. That way you can go back and not do the project that <laughs> that didn't land. So if you do that, that would be that would be great. I think that would be a good solution. Well, one, one way of dealing with this is to get early engineering yeah, into public hands, so to speak, either in a designated open source lab or something like this, right? Obviously the problem, as David pointed out, is like you often don't want to let your uh, uh, new ideas surface too early, right? For competitive reasons, right? When when understand that, but at the same point, uh, you know, getting some engineers on maybe even emulation software, right? I mean, that that, uh, that would already help, right? Because as you know, once the hardware is baked, there's very little you can change anymore, right? And you have to work around it. Okay, great. Thanks. So. Um... Up next, we have some questions about um, getting into open source, um, about new contributors joining the projects and so on. So the first one is virtualization and systems programming is in general considered low level, uh, is a low level software field um, that new developers may find inaccessible. How do you recommend getting started in open source virtualization as a developer? Um, stop, stop submitting patches is really the, the key here. I mean, I think some people um, don't see the low level aspect as being a barrier, but see it as um, something that's really interesting and exciting. I mean, you know, anyone can develop web applications, um, but uh, developing, you know, low level bit banging hardware stuff is, is uh, a rare skill and um, exciting and interesting for many people. So uh, I, I don't see that being a barrier particularly. Yes, I mean, in some ways, working at a low level is kind of, it, it's almost easier because if I'm working on emulation of some feature, somebody has helpfully produced a several thousand page specification that says exactly what it needs to do. I don't have to guess. I don't have to do all this. I don't have to deal with UI aspects very much, which is just as well because I'm terrible at them. Um, so in some ways, it's quite easy. It's like this, the spec says this is what you've got to do. You've just got to translate it all into code and hopefully it will work. Um, I, I think kind of the the barrier to entry with some of this is that s software components like Quemu are now so huge. We have millions of lines of code that it could be hard to get a grasp on where, where you should maybe start. So I think my advice for that is not to try and grasp the whole thing in your brain at once, because nobody on the project has a view of how the whole thing works. But you kind of 
maybe you have a small outline of where roughly all the pieces are but mostly it's like ignore all the stuff that is not relevant to whatever feature you're trying to implement and just go ahead and try and deal with the bit look at the code that you need to look at and don't look at the other 900,000 lines basically well, one one choice is to basically look at the open uh, uh, open issues list and and pick one that looks interesting that's number one number two well, with RPMs and things, in many cases, you can stand up the system into a running level. And my favorite tool for that is basically just run it under a debugger and hit Control C and see where you end up, right? And that's often just walking the stack gives you a lot of insights into any uh, any software system, right? And at least in, in in the past, that's how I learned systems, right? Really, just hitting Control C at, at runtime and seeing where's the code currently stuck and what can I learn along the way. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, any any other suggestions on how to get started uh, in open source virtualization? I think the other thing I would say is to it helps a lot to come and talk to us um, because we know the code base. We know what kind of features seem like they're relatively tractable for somebody who's new. And some parts of Quemu are to be honest, just not very well maintained. So if you're coming along and your idea is I'm going to contribute to um, some part of Quemu, and it turns out that there's actually nobody else in the upstream community that's really working on that at the moment, it's going to be much harder to find somebody to review your code or see, give you suggestions or whatever. So if that's the thing you really, really want to do, then go ahead and do it. But if you're kind of just interested in general in getting started, then picking an area where there are other people working who can give you a helping hand, I think is important. Thank you. So as a follow-up, I think you mentioned, um, you know, subsystems that are maintained to various degrees. Um, one of the interesting things that sometimes um, comes up in, in, in upstream contributions is this difference in, 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 the, in the maybe quality or the amount of time that's been invested in different parts of QEMU. And we have a question here that says, is QEMU still accessible for hobbyists with limited time? And I guess that may be referring to we have a lot of infrastructure in QMU that someone who's new and maybe only focused on one particular new feature would have to learn and 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 and, and, and might not know. Um, so, what are your thoughts on on that? How can we make QMU not just a good corporate open source project, but also good for hobbyists? There's always been a dilemma with um, with very large open source projects that you you have to put these kind of standards and codes of you know contributions and style guides in place uh, because you 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 hope to increase the, the total quality of the code by doing that. But you actually by doing that you also make it harder to contribute. Um, I don't know if there's a really good answer to that really, um, except to probably make it more automated so that um, you know even if people aren't necessarily fully aware of how to format their patch or something they can submit something and then they will get an automated return saying you know format it this way and then they can proceed in steps that way but I, I don't think that any project has really solved this very well. Yeah, so I think that it's got to be harder for hobbyists these days just because Quemu is bigger and standards of, we have gradually raised standards as you, as you have to, as Quemu has sort of morphed from being a, here's a nice emulator toy to here's something that's actually going in people's uh, servers and that's got a security boundary and all the issues associated with it. And so it's harder. I think it is still possible, absolutely. Um, but also the direction of the project is going to be influenced by who is putting in more hours and inevitably the corporate contributors are putting in the bulk of the hours and that's that's just the way it is. I, I do agree with Richard that we could definitely do better about making our process easier. We have a fairly old school process that's mostly borrowed from the way that the Linux kernel tends to work 
and that is not very sort of 21st century friendly to new contributors but changing process is very hard though so Okay, thank you. We have some questions about containers and VMs. Uh, the combination of containers and VMs or the choice between them or using both has been an interesting thing to see in the past few years. Um, so the question we have is, how do you see the future usage of full machine virtualization evolving into um, the, 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 the ongoing competition from container-based deployment models? Well, I mean, I think we've seen for a really long time, particularly since um, Intel's Clear Linux project, which has sort of morphed over time into CATA containers, that um, there is a space for the two to coexist for um, the virtualization technologies, in the, certainly in the hardware and the low levels of the stack, to harden containers. Because at the end of the day, containers aren't actually very secure and people are using them in, a, um, in the expectation that they are as secure as virtualization, which I'm afraid they, they aren't really. Um, but with virtualization technologies at the bottom end, you can actually give people that promise, deliver on that promise. So I think that's where it's going. So the... Yeah, I also think there's a, there, there's a spectrum, right? I mean, when you go from containers, you have exactly the kernel exposures, right? I mean, there are various projects that we are, for instance, pursuing and trying to figure out, can we actually take some of the emerging virtualization techniques and isolation features that hardware provide us and basically drive them deeper into the kernel, right? So you have actually memory management techniques uh, to isolate parts of the kernel because the kernel doesn't have to touch many of the data structures that the user uses, right? At the same time, uh, uh, you're basically having a resource problem, right? Containers are rather thin. You love the, uh, the way of uh, con how containers are being managed, right? And uh, slipping a VM underneath will cost you dearly, right? In terms of uh, memory overhead and things like this. So one way, and I think QMU is already going after that, is basically how you can get to thinner machines. How can you make your distribution smaller, right? So that the overhead you're paying for a virtual machine backing a container is basically uh, removed or not at least reduced, right? So there's basically across the stack, many things that can be done to provide the customer choice, right? Uh, where you can still get the same way of managing uh, your applications, maybe through a container image, right? But at the same time, provides increased, uh, increased uh, uh, security or even isolation, right? I mean, there are uh, various projects where we, uh, for instance, the uh, security features of uh, SAV or TDX can be basically raised with a VM to back a cutter container as an example. Yeah, to me, I think my personal opinion is I think uh, this is, to me, I think this is not a binary choice. Is a, you know, is a VM or a container, right? To me, I think that's, uh, this will be a kind of a blended technology. So that's, uh, and the people may have a, a different usage uh, requirement. And then we will pick the, um, you know, kind of technology that is best suit for them, right? So for example, I think today it's, uh, you know, um, uh, um, you know, it's already in the container space as Richard and, uh, you know, who just mentioned, there was, uh, you know, the uh, using the VT technology, the lightweight VM technology to improve the security and isolation for container, right? And also a lot of, uh, you know, container, I think 80% of the container today that's uh, running in the VM, right? So not one container in one VM, but, uh, you know, um, there were pods in the one VM. So I think that's, uh, um, you know, yeah, I think it's not a bad choice to me. That's uh, this kind of, uh, you know, it was to be a blended technology. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. You know, I, I think that the use cases of lightweight virtualization are, are really interesting with containers. Uh, I also wonder what sort of the economic impact is going to be uh, if it becomes just so much cheaper to run container type workloads and especially in public clouds, it could incentivize people to go even further down that path potentially. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. We, we're reaching the end of our time. So I want to thank you all for being part of this panel. And I hope that um, this was a good discussion that everyone enjoyed. Thank you very much. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.